This sketchy looking device is a demonstration of deformable mirror technology. And it uses a really clever and simple principle, which you can see can be done in a pretty low tech manner. I saw a paper a couple years ago describing how to make a thermally actuated deformable mirror and I just had to try it. The thing I loved about this paper is that instead of using piezoelectric or electromagnetic or some kind of fancy actuator, it uses resistors and these form thermal actuators to move the mirror. The setup is pretty simple. There's a four by four matrix of resistors that are bonded to this mirror on top. This is just a glass cover slip that I coated with silver. There's silver epoxy on the bottom side that connects all of the resistor legs to a single ground wire. And then all of the individual resistors are connected to a series of shift registers and an Arduino. And the principle is super simple. It's that when you pass current through a resistor, it heats up and that heat will expand and physically grow the size of the individual resistor. And so as you address each resistor and pass current through it, that section of the mirror will shift upwards and you'll gain some deformation of the mirror at the top. Now the program that's currently running will heat up the left side of the mirror, but not the right side. So I've got the a temperature probe stuck onto one of the resistors. You can see right now it's around 30 degrees Celsius. When this LED kicks on, it'll start heating this side by passing current through it, and we should see the temperature rise. It cycles every two minutes, so give it a sec. There it goes. So the LED's on, this should be heating, and we should see the temperature start to increase. Okay, so the program just turned off and we topped out around 45, 46 degrees Celsius, and it'll start to fall back down to ambient now that it's not being heated. We can probe the other side and see that these resistors, let's see, right there are still basically at ambient. So why do we even care about these deformable mirrors? Aren't mirrors supposed to be like stiff and rigid so they hold their shape? Uh, and that is true. Most mirrors traditionally are made out of some material like glass or ceramic, something that's stiff and has a low coefficient of thermal expansion because you don't want that mirror surface to change as it heats up or cools down or changes orientation and position. However, there's a problem with telescopes here on Earth and it's that they have to look through the atmosphere to see any stars. Uh, and this is a problematic because the atmosphere itself introduces aberrations. Uh, it changes the wavefront of the light that's coming into the telescope. And the reason for this is due to atmospheric turbulence, so more or less dense pockets of atmosphere or hotter or colder pockets of gas, wind, like anything that's going on up there can subtly alter the direction of the light that's coming in. So. When you look up and see a star that's twinkling, this is caused by the atmospheric turbulence that's above you. The light from that star is hitting different pockets of hot or cold or dense atmosphere, and it's subtly changing the direction of that light. So of course, this is something that astronomers don't want happening to their telescopes, which is why you typically find observatories at the tops of mountains and other remote locations. By putting it at a high elevation or somewhere with low humidity and nice calm upper atmosphere, you can reduce the effects of this atmospheric turbulence. But you're always going to have it to some degree because you know, there's atmosphere above us. So the next way to tackle it is something called adaptive optics. And this is essentially identifying the turbulence that's through the atmosphere that you're looking at and then altering your optical stack to negate any of that aberration. And the way this is done is with a wavefront sensor that monitors in real time how much turbulence is affecting a guide star, for example. And then you use something like a deformable mirror, a mirror that can change its shape very quickly to do the inverse of what the atmosphere is doing. So you can cancel out that distortion of the gas above you and get a nice clean picture. So the device works, right? It heats up and just based on, you know, thermodynamics and how physics works, this should be expanding in length and changing the shape of the mirror. And this is where I ran into problems, which is why it got stuck for like a year and a half. 
The most obvious thing to do is try to measure the surface of this mirror using interferometry. I tried that, I set up a Michelson interferometer, and uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> or rather, it works, but the surface of this mirror is so bad that we can't really get good, reliable fringes to count. And the reason for that is just, you know, the whole thing is pretty sketchy and the bonding of this cover slip to all of the legs of the resistor has altered and warped the shape of the mirror. So it's no longer flat, which means the fringes we get out of it are just a complete mess. So try as I might, I couldn't get a good set of fringes to actually measure this interferometrically, which would have been the easiest thing to do. So the next thing I tried was bouncing a laser off of the mirror basically setting up an optical lever, and the idea is that you bounce the laser, it goes some distance and hits a piece of paper or a sensor or something, and then as the displacement of this changes, it will alter the angle that the laser is bouncing, and you'll see a displacement of the spot. Unfortunately, again, because this surface is non-uniform and not flat, it was hard to trust the data coming out of that measurement system because the laser would kind of wobble and move around as all these individual resistor elements change the shape of the mirror. So it wasn't an, an easy thing to track. While I was editing, I realized I tried another method of kind of laser measuring, uh, and it's essentially a laser speckle method. So in the past, I've done digital image correlation where you look at some type of like paint or textured pattern on uh, say like tensile test pieces. And as that speckle changes and moves, you can record it with a camera and software will determine kind of the deformation of those speckles. So you can do a similar thing if you shine a speckled light onto a surface. So for example, taking a laser and passing it through a piece of scotch tape or something will generate a really nice speckle pattern that doesn't change as long as you don't move the tape on the laser. Uh, and you can bounce that off the mirror surface and then record the speckles onto a, an image sensor, either directly or against like a piece of paper or a wall, and measure how those speckles change over time. It looks like maybe it was working. Uh, it was too hard for me to really trust, like actually quantify it, but you can kind of see how the left side of the mirror that we're recording seems to be changing while the right side doesn't. So that kind of tracks. But again, it was really hard to trust because the setup was a little, a little iffy. At some point I decided to just try mechanical measuring. So I put these dots in a grid pattern across the top of the mirror and just used a mechanical probe to try to record all the positions before and after it was turned on. And there's just too much variability to really do that. So we're going to show the most basic form of measurement here where the left side gets hot and the right side stays cold and we'll see that the left side moves up while the right side doesn't, which isn't quite as sophisticated as I wanted. I was hoping really to show, you know, turning on one resistor and seeing that spot move, but I just don't have a good way to measure that. So here's the setup. We've got the device over here. This is a tenths test indicator, meaning that each division of the indicator is a ten thousandth of an inch, which is like 2.54 microns. We will slide it over on top of the device on the left side and then bring it down so that it's engaged like so. And the, right now the probe tip is touching but not the arm. And then I'm gonna set the camera directly above it and we'll watch the indicator on video and hopefully see an oscillation back and forth as it heats up and cools down. Now, you might be wondering why we don't really see this in professional observatories. You know, as far as I'm aware, no professional academic observatory has any thermal actuated deformable mirrors. Um, the reason for that is just due to the speed of actuation. These thermal actuators are just slow, right? It's slow to heat up. It's slow to cool back down. 
they're fixable problems. You can pump more heat into it to speed up how quickly it heats up and then actively cool it with fans or water cooling or something. But it's a lot of work when you can just use piezos and they're more accurate, more precise and faster. So it's not really a practical technique, even though it's a cool technique for a hobbyist because you can throw it together in an afternoon with basically junk out of your electronics bin. So I think it's a neat teaching demonstration, but ultimately is not super practical for real world applications. That being said, the paper does make a point that it's pretty good at correcting low order Zernike aberrations. So the lower orders are things like piston, up and down, tip and tilt, uh, basic astigmatism, stuff like that. And the reason it's good at this is because these aberrations are pretty slow to change, so they don't need a quick response time, and the magnitude of movement needed to correct them is pretty large. And so the thermal mechanism can get you large displacements pretty easily, whereas other techniques like piezos, it's more challenging. If you need to move 10 or 20 microns with a piezo, it's becoming a difficult problem, whereas it's really not a big deal to make a resistor grow 10 microns. Ugh. Okay, it's like 90 degrees in here and I'm melting. So we're gonna keep this brief. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Um, as I mentioned at the top, I'm still moving into this space, so a lot of my gear is not unpacked yet. I'm getting used to acoustics. In any case, thanks for bearing with me while we're getting settled into this new space. And if you enjoyed today's video but aren't subscribed, feel free to hit that subscribe button. And otherwise, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.